Welcome to the Reason Roundtable, your weekly refuge from the way people normally talk about politics, uh, brought to you by the magazine uh, Free Minds and Free Markets, and whose editor-in-chief definitely will not be featured in an upcoming uh, chart-topping rap single. I am Matt Welch, joined hopefully on video as well uh, by Nick Gillespie, Peter Suderman, and Catherine Mangu Ward. Sup, y'all? Howdy. Hey, Matt. Happy Monday. So if you thought that 2024 was going to be a relaxing year, I would like the name of your doctor, uh, please. Uh, and just looking over the uh, Drudge Report this morning, uh, he went to the blood red headlines, which is always a good sign. Uh, and these were the big ones in all caps. Uh, drone wars, McConnell calls for striking Iran and nuke warning. So welcome to uh, this week. Uh, three U.S. service members were killed and 34 were injured in an attack inside Jordan on Sunday. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in the program. Uh, but first, um, still more chaos and more chaotic politics down at the southern border with Mexico. I will try to bullet point as fast as I can in chronological order the developments over the past week, beginning last Monday when the Supreme Court ordered the state of Texas by a 5-4 vote uh, to allow federal border agents access to the border with Mexico, presumably to cut some of the razor wire that Governor Greg Abbott down there has installed both in the Rio Grande and near it, um, especially around the Eagle Pass area. Ten days prior to that, the Texas National Guard had blocked Border Patrol agents from accessing the river when three migrants were dying, a mother and two kids, uh, and there are two others uh, uh, who were in the river at that same time. On Wednesday, Governor Abbott issued a statement defying the Supreme Court's order, calling the large number of border crossings an invasion, thereby triggering a constitutional right to state self-defense. Also on Wednesday, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell reportedly said in a GOP meeting that the Republican attempt to attach a bunch of border security items to a Ukraine aid bill uh, was now in limbo because, quote, we don't want to do anything to undermine Donald Trump. On Thursday, the Republican Governors Association uh, issued a statement signed by 20 five GOP governors standing in solidarity with Abbott. Uh, Donald Trump then encouraged them to send their own National Guard units down to the border to help out. And the hashtag civil war began trending on Twitter. On Friday, President Biden urged passage of the border Ukraine deal, saying, quote, it would give me as president a new emergency authority to shut down the border when it becomes overwhelmed. And if given that authority, I would use it the day I signed the bill into law. And then on Saturday, the Oklahoma Republican Party condemned and censured the Republican senator from Oklahoma, James Lankford, for working on that border Ukraine package, which they described as an open border deal. In a rally that day, Donald Trump said, quote, as the leader of our party, there is zero chance I will support this horrible open borders betrayal of America. Catherine, um, do we need a complete and total shutdown of immigration politics until we can figure out what's going on? Yes. And if given that power, I will use it on the first day that I have. <laughs> <laughs> first hour. Yeah. Um, I, I want to start actually with the um, <clears throat> with the Senator Lankford, uh, Oklahoma GOP thing, because it was it, to me, it was just such a fantastic microcosm of the whole thing um, in particular. OK, so again, remember this this man's crime is just like talking with people about a bipartisan deal like like he was just like doing legislating um which is his job and you know it's, it's we wouldn't want congress to do that it's no not god forbid god forbid congress should do the the stuff that congress is supposed to do so in the resolution uh condemning and censuring him uh sorry censuring his open border deal um this language was in there and i just want to like have us sit with the language whereas authorizing several thousand people to invade our borders before any action can be taken is contrary to the oath that Senator Lanford took to the Constitution. What does it mean authorizing people to invade our borders? Like that's a nonsensical concept. Like there's this attempt to draw a bright line between legal and illegal immigrants. Um, this has always been kind of dubious, especially around asylum seekers and several other categories of immigrants who can come without prior authorization under our laws already. Um, the idea that we are going to end up in a, 
a sort of standoff between National Guard and um, and federal border officers is uh, very, very, very troubling. And this Oklahoma thing just seems so silly and sort of so internally incoherent um, that I, I kind of want to use it like as a, I don't know, like a microcosm for this whole conversation. Like it's it's just people making up reasons for their side to have the backing of the Constitution. And like this resolution isn't going to get us in or out of it. Let's steel man our Oklahoman friends for a second here, Catherine, mm-hmm. which is to say that a thousands number is a thing that exists in, in the deal, or at least uh, is our understanding of it, that if there are more than 5,000 um, uh, illegal border crossing, then that will be the numerical trigger for doing some kind of total uh, shutdown of the border. So, um, you know, it's a transitive property argument, but it's uh, but it's certainly um, they're tethering something to a thousands language in the bill, right? But I think it's just the idea of the authorization of an invasion. Like it's the it's the use of the invasion language. It's you know, we can we can you know I don't authorize an invasion of my home when I invite you over for dinner. Like that's that's not the right way to think about it. And of course we can let people in. Of course we can choose to let people in. Of course we can choose to not let people in. That's the legitimate business of Congress to figure that out. Nick, there are a lot of Republicans, our Oklahoma friends, and a lot of non-Republicans as well, including people running for president. Your, your Oklahoma friends, Ben. My, I'm I am very friendly with all people. Um, who are, they're basically making the counter argument that uh, it's ridiculous to like hinge border enforcement or Biden saying that, you know, I will you know do this yeah. enforcement on day one of this bill being signed when the president has broad latitude to enforce immigration policy already. Do they have a point? Uh, the point that they have, and I think that increasingly people in the country are, are bothered by, is the idea that the border is chaotic and that we don't have an immigration policy that's working. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, what we're turning the United States into is like a gigantic who concert, except people trying to, you know, people trying to get in and being stampeded because they're hearing good music here. What we need fundamentally is a better border situation where there is more control of where people come in and where they don't. The solution to that is not by criminalizing more and more people and laying more and more barbed wire. It's by expanding the number of places where people can come in legally, and more importantly, and this is something that the Biden administration did pretty successfully, and it really needs, and then cap their own success on it. But we need to be doing more parole in countries where people are coming on mass, where uh, people who want to come here legally, whether it's from Mexico or Honduras or Ukraine, <clears throat> excuse me, or wherever go to the embassies or the consulates in their country and actually work to get pre-approved where they have people who will bring them here and will sponsor them, uh, typically the parole or currently the parole term is for about two years. They come here, they are pre-vetted and they are uh, authorized to work. Um, Doing that kind of stuff is going to alleviate uh, all kinds of problems on the border. But we need to, I think fundamentally, delink what's going on in the border with larger immigration policy, which we have not done because at least realistically, since George Bush got reelected and tried to do comprehensive immigration reform, we have stopped talking about that. And all of the focus is on what's going on on the border. Uh, And as long as we're doing that, we're in trouble as a country. Biden, I think, is rightly in trouble because he hasn't addressed this type of stuff, trying to do it now. Uh, the Republicans, you know, have made clear, and this is disturbing, even if it's politically astute. Everybody, like every poll shows, more people are nervous about what's going on in the border because people keep seem to keep coming, not through points of entry, but wherever. That's going to cause a lot of chaos. And, uh, you know, like uh, CBS YouGov poll um, shows 75 percent of people think there's a crisis or it's very serious on the border, that's up, you know, like 25 points from a couple months before that. You know, something needs to happen, but it's not going to happen through a political standoff like this, unfortunately. Peter, you're an astute uh, watcher of Mitch McConnell. What do you make of his intervention, his leaking, I presume, uh, last week? And what does that say about uh, your your sense of whether there's 
going to be a more likely or less likely chance that we will see uh, that border security bill and or Ukraine funding come out of all of this? I think so much of what we are seeing is election year posturing. That's true of the Oklahoma letter that um, Catherine referenced. It's also true of what's going on in Congress right now, where Congress was at least making some steps towards a bipartisan immigration deal, not one that libertarians would necessarily support, but they were at least trying to do some legislating. And what Donald Trump has signaled to the Republican Party is he does not want them to do that for fear that it might work because the the, like he, he what Donald Trump wants is for there to be chaos at the border so that he can run against Joe Biden on Biden. You're not controlling the border. What McConnell basically said last week was, yeah, we're going to let Donald Trump do that. Now, he has walked that back since and said, actually, we're going to try to proceed with a deal. But I do think that the way that that news cycle played out uh, makes it pretty clear that Republicans are very willing to let the border chaos continue because they view it as an electoral advantage. And it's really kind of telling. It's it's cynical and it's gross and it's awful that the party that is supposedly now in favor of border control actually seems to be, at least in the short term, at least for the rest of 2024, basically uninterested in doing any sort of uh, real legislating on this issue because they believe that it is uh, that it will be politically advantageous to them in the presidential election coming up in November if things are bad at the border and people blame Joe Biden for it. And, but it is important to note that things are bad at the border yes, and they true. have continued to get bad. It's you know, there's no question the Republicans here are awful at the national level, probably at the state level. But there is, you know, we there is something that needs to be changed. Um, and that's not happening at all. That's true. And this is a bipartisan failure. And both parties have played politics here. I mean, the Democratic position seems to be we want some sort of strict border laws to be in place and also not to do any real legislating or ever enforce those laws. That's not a tenable position. No. But the Republican position is chaos is good for Donald Trump. And therefore, we should probably let that chaos persist at least as long as Joe Biden is president so that we can pin it on him. Yeah. Catherine, um, speaking of untenability, uh, Cato's Alex uh, now Rasta, who is an immigration liberalizer, uh, had a pretty good uh, Twitter thread over the weekend um, contextualizing all of this stuff. And uh, even in the middle of that, he had this following thing that caught my eye, quote, the immigration court backlog is currently about 3.3 million. Those migrants are going to be waiting, working, and living in the United States for a long time, and many won't leave even if the court orders them to go, end quote. That's just crazy untenable, isn't it? I mean, not just as a as a kind of practical thing, but uh, certainly as a political thing. Yeah, I mean, Alex is basically always right about everything with respect to immigration. I, I associate myself with him I can't think of a time that he's been wrong. So um, I think that, you know, his persistent efforts to point out what the status quo really is um, are really important. Like they're here. They're already here. And and that's, again, why I think this invasion language is so weird and so unhelpful. It's it's not it's not like this isn't a Mars attacks situation. It's not a Mars attack situation. And, uh, you know, the Martians are already (laughs) among us, I guess. And it's fine. Um, It's more like Alien Nation, which was itself an extended sci-fi parable about immigration assimilation. Great movie with Mandy Patinkin. So as with actual aliens, when when they come, we would be better off to welcome them, to talk with them, to have them. Uh, you know, to treat them with respect, uh, to not have them risk their lives to come here. Uh, I can't I can't speak to how the actual alien invasion is going to go, but we already know what happens when we let people in. And, uh, you know, when we let people in in a as you know, Nick is correct to know that the border is a mess. But one solution, which I know is not on the table right now in our current political climate, but like one solution, one way to prevent a a messy, deadly, confusing, politically polarizing, playable disaster at the border is to just let people come here, to just make the doors of legal entry, like to throw them open wider. And it doesn't mean we have to let every single person come here, although I think 
maybe that would still be the way, honestly. But the vast majority of people once, who I don't mean, have communicable yeah, if we, diseases if we and don't have, have, y'all with have your criminal asterisks. histories. Take your asterisks and leave. Like yeah. I, I like I just think in the end, uh, if if we are looking for a solution to this truly horrible situation, both at the border and all these people who are living within the country who are being told at any time, you know, maybe your status will be revoked. Maybe you will have to be thrown out. Maybe you'll have to choose between staying where your life is and going into hiding or going back to a place that you left for a reason. Um, I, I just think that we could just choose more openness. That is really an option. And I think the only morally defensible one. But I also think a really pragmatic one. I, I genuinely think that this is doable. Um, and Alex, as usual, has like some excellent concrete steps that we could take, including stuff like you know, getting the you – know, simplifying and speeding up the – the paperwork backlog for people who are already here. One of the points that Alex makes in that post that is very good is that this is a demand issue and this is a demand side issue because the U.S. economy is in some ways, especially with regards to the job market, actually doing pretty well. Um, and, and like there are there are a lot of job openings, especially for lower skilled labor. And so people want to come here. And so to me, the, the operating metaphor here is not um, movies from the 1990s about um, alien detectives or or um, alien invasions. Instead, it's prohibition. And and people resist this metaphor when it comes to immigration because they see it as something fundamentally different. But it's really this. It's really very similar in so many ways because there is a demand for something. Um, it, with prohibition, it was alcohol. Uh, with immigration, it is good jobs and a better life for your family. And that demand is not going to go away just because you cr try to put an artificial barrier in, in the way of it, right? Instead, people are going to try, um, they're going to try to get it through means that are more dangerous and more chaotic. And it's going to create a secondary market in violence and criminality. That is what happened in Prohibition. And it's what what is happening with the border. And if you want to tamp down on crime and if you want to uh, make it harder for, uh, for for people, for gang members and violent people to come in uh, to cross the border, then what we need to do is we need to say people who are obviously peaceful and just want to come here and work and contribute to the economy, they can come in. And there's an easy and straightforward process for them to do that. And then we're going to focus our efforts on catching the actual bad guys who want to come over here and do bad stuff. It'd be nice to hear a president, you know, who has the bully pulpit really come out and say exactly that, that we're a nation of immigrants uh, and that everybody who wants to live and work peacefully is welcome here. It does cause disruption. We're going to meter it out. So it's not, you know, like a billion people coming in the first year or anything like that, but we're going to expedite it. Right now, as much as anything, and this is true not just of immigration, but it's true of economics, it's true of foreign policy, we don't have a national meta narrative of like, what is America about? And as a result, you start to see uh, people knock off things. Uh, force Republicans to say that they don't want anybody new in the country because things are perfect the way they are. Force left wingers to admit that we cannot admit people and, you know, that not that this happens, but it's the fear. You can't just bring in a lot of people who are immediately going to go on welfare rolls, which, by the way, if we continue with current asylum policy, if you bring people in and they can't work, that's like fucked up beyond belief. Let people come here and live and work openly and honestly. They don't get welfare. They don't necessarily get citizenship, but they do get legal status and they're going to move into the parts of the country where there are opportunity. And that will take care of all sorts of problems rather than cause any. But we, we need to be talking about why immigration is important to the country, not just in economic terms, uh, but also in kind of national and identity terms. And we also need to talk about the, the fears that people have where, you know, part of this is a larger anxiety that's throughout the country in all different ways about the future, about how things are shifting radically out of the world that most of us grew up in and didn't like when we had it, we wanted it to change. But now we look back nostalgically as if, you know, the 1970s uh, when immigration was very low is somehow a good thing. I mean, fashion, yes, it was a great thing, the 1970s. And it's pretty good in music, underrepresented, yeah. Uh, Prog the, rock and bell bottoms, bring them back. Matt likes the colors. Elephant, elephant bottoms, bell bottoms, eh, yes. elephant bottoms. Not enough. All right. As mentioned at the top, uh, Iranian-backed militias killed three U.S. troops 
wounded 34 others in a drone strike on a military outpost in Jordan. Uh, on Sunday, President Joe Biden uh, tweeted firmly in response, have no doubt we will hold all those responsible to account at a time and in a manner of our choosing. Republican hawks, who apparently still exist as long as Lindsey Graham draws breath yeah. on this earth, uh, called for bombing Iran. Uh, Peter, you don't like oh, World uh, War Three. Excuse me, Matt. He said hit Iran now, hit them hard. Yeah, that's a bomb. Lindsey Graham. That's a bomb. I'm right? just saying that's, he's uh, translating. He is, he is signaling to Grinder something <laughs> deep in his subconscious. That's I don't I'm know saying. what you're doing, Mr. Gillespie, but I like it. Peter, uh, uh, you Joe don't like Biden also finishes every policy pronouncement by saying, oh, and I like ice cream. I like ice cream. Yeah. Uh, uh, time and place of our own choosing. I like ice cream. Come on, man. Uh, Peter, uh, you're scared about World War Three all the time. Uh, how is a reluctant imperialist supposed to react when Iran keeps proxy warring us all the damn time? Yeah, it's a it's a tough question. I, I think one of the things that is interesting or that is worth thinking about here is, uh, according to reports this morning, the U.S. intelligence uh, military um, apparatus is doesn't still doesn't think that Iran actually wants to start a larger war. And that I think is is pretty important because if Iran wants to start a larger war with us, then they're probably going to be able to do it. Uh, it right? Like if they just want to go ahead and say, we're doing the big war, we're doing it now. Uh, it's happening whether you, whether or not you like it, then that's going to happen. And so what we want to do is have as uh, design some sort of response that is not going to trigger, that is not going to change that. It's not going to trigger a desire to start a larger war. That's not going to make them feel like, well, we're backed into a corner and it's a big war no matter what. Uh, so that's what we want to do. And I think the Republican bellicosity on this issue is so telling and so frustrating because they're not thinking about the consequences. They're not thinking about the downside risk of attacking inside Iran, which is what a bunch of Republican sitting members of Congress and the Senate are are saying right now. Um, you know, it's not just Lindsey Graham. It's John Cornyn. Target to Rant was his tweet. Uh, Senate Minority Leader uh, Mitch McConnell, to go back to him, right? Uh, serious crippling costs to Iran, not only on frontline terrorist proxies, but on their Iranian sponsors, blah, 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 this sort of thing, right? It, and it is, it is a posture of, uh, of, of aggression without regard to the possibility that we could end up in a war that costs a lot more American lives. And I just think that people continue to underrate that. Yes, it's satisfying and even necessary to hit back when somebody kills some of your soldiers. You can't let, you can't let that go completely unresponded to. At the same time, you have to consider like what are the what's the possibility that this could break out into something much larger with a, a regional power that has the capability of killing an awful lot of people, even if we are probably stronger than them in the long run? Why are we in Syria? Why do we have troops in Syria? Uh, and what authorizes troops to be in Syria and Iraq at this point? That is a foundational question. And it's weird. You know, the Republicans aren't asking that question now, but they will, uh, you know, when it becomes politically advantageous. But you know, this is the problem with having troops scattered all over the place. The reason, you know, what Iran is doing in the region is trying to destabilize any kind of either, you know, actual accords or growing accords between places like Israel and UAE and Israel and Saudi Arabia. America shouldn't have troops there. America, if they want regional stability, it would have been nice not to have spent a couple of decades destroying Iraq, which was the, uh, you know, the regional uh, opponent and nemesis of Iran and held them in check. Obviously, all we did was destroy that country so that Iran can have a, a bigger hand. But we should be spending all of our diplomatic efforts right now trying to build up a regional coalition of countries that all fucking hate Iran, uh, which they do, because everything that's happening in Syria is because Iran wants it. Um, I think that's a more foundational question. And Republicans need to be held accountable for being terrible when it comes to foreign policy. They almost always have the wrong instinct, except when occasional outliers in their party say, hey, you know what, we should be involved in fewer places militarily than more. 
Much of the Republicans' response here is, as with the border issue, just an attempt to capitalize on election year politics here. They're trying to make Joe Biden look weak. I think they're trying to play into, oh, he's old, he's doddering, he's you know one of these peace-loving, uh, weak Democrats. It's we can't have the hippies in charge at this time of danger. I mean, like you know, it's he's It's, not the worst, but he's you know, yeah. What I mean, it's it's not all. It isn't all just that the Republican, you know, the Republicans keep taking advantage of how shitty Joe Biden is. It's like we need to I mean, this is the problem, right? From a libertarian perspective, you know, the Republicans and the Democrats aren't offering anything. But, you know, we should nobody should be, uh, you know, when you're beating the drums for war in the Middle East, uh, nobody should take you seriously. And especially if you are part of of a government and an administration, and certainly people like Lindsey Graham and John Cornyn and Mitch McConnell, they have they are absolutely central to 20 years of god awful foreign policy, as is Joe Biden. Um, so, yeah, the question isn't whether we are weak or strong; it's whether we are prudent. Uh, Catherine, you're prudent. I heard you uh, attempting to talk. What were we going to say? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I just wanted to throw one more quote in there, which is Tom Cotton, my personal yes. favorite hate figure, um, calling Joe Biden a coward, unworthy of being commander in chief unless he brings devastating military retaliation against Iran's terrorist forces, both in Iran and across the Middle East. This is, you know, that piece of it is just largely the electioneering of it all, right? Like, hey, I'm trying to I'm trying to put an idea in the American people's minds of what Joe Biden is. He's a coward. And there it is. Um, but I, I think the flip side of this and, you know, Tom Cotton is, is certainly um, he is, you know, he certainly partakes in this ideology, which is that um, courage and like, you know, danger and war are opportunities for virtue. I mean, this is I do think if we're I don't know if we're steel manning, but like there is this belief you know, on the part of some of the less stupid Republicans <laughs> that. Um, maybe war would be good for this country. Maybe war is what we need. Maybe we are being cowards and having our little our little groups of Americans here and there. Um, you know, when Nick says, well, why are we there? Why are we in all these places? At least one answer to that question is like, we are looking for opportunities to bravely crusade for justice around the world. And we're going to take them when they come. And maybe this is it. Now, I think that's wrong. I think that's spectacularly wrongheaded. One clue that it's spectacularly wrongheaded is Tom Cotton believes it. Um, but, I, you know, I I think that there is, it's sort of the same thing that we're talking about at the border. Like people are looking for an opportunity for a single, simple concept that we can use to make sense of a chaotic situation. And maybe a big war with a big enemy is what we need. I think that that idea is powerful. In fairness to Tom Cotton, he has been very consistent about wanting to uh, uh, overthrow the government in Iran since even before he was in the Senate. Hundred um, percent. He's not dumb. He's just super, super yeah. wrong. He's not inconsistent. He's not hypocritical. He's just wrong. All right, we're gonna get to our uh, listener email of the week uh, here in a moment. But first, the world would be a better, freer, and happier place if constitutional protections for private property were taken more seriously. That's why our good friends over at the Institute for Justice have released a new season of their hit legal history podcast, Bound by Oath. Bound by Oath tells the story of how the Supreme Court has cleared the way for government officials to abuse property rights, to trespass on private land without a warrant, to restrict peaceful and productive uses of property, to seize and keep property without sufficient justification, and many more outrages. Featuring interviews not only with scholars and litigators, but also with the real-life people behind some of the Supreme Court's most momentous property rights decisions, the new season explores the history behind today's civil rights battles. Please do look up Bound by Oath wherever you get your podcasts. That's Bound by Oath, Institute for Justice, IJ, Property Rights. Do it all today. You'll be glad you did. All right, reminder, email your snappy queries to roundtable at reason.com. This one comes from Christian, who writes in part, High Roundtable, Monday's discussion about Javier Malay got me thinking, are libertarians too obsessed with economic growth? 
As we all know, growing the economy means that there is, in theory, more prosperity to be shared with more people. This is great and everything. <laughs> but shouldn't we also recognize that growing the economy sometimes comes at a cost? We know that biodiversity is increasingly under threat. A million animals and plants are threatened with extinction, some of them within decades. Is the current trajectory sustainable? If not, shouldn't we temper our enthusiasm for economic growth and make the case for growing more sustainably? After all, if economic growth is the one and only ultimate goal, what is stopping us from tearing down rainforests? What is the point of trying to preserve the commons, such as wildlife habitats? Why bother building so many parks and recreational areas when we can build more of the profitable stuff? In my view, libertarians should be better at recognizing that some things in life transcend the economic sphere. Catherine, how do you plead? I plead, uh, I guess, guilty. Um, I think I am obsessed with economic growth. I think uh, there almost is no such thing as being too obsessed with economic growth. And I think it's because a um, complete understanding of growth contains all of these things that the letter writer wants us to think about and cherish and protect. That it turns out that when people are wealthier and have more choices, that they choose to do all this stuff. They choose to protect biodiversity. They choose to make parks. They choose to... Uh, make room for stuff beyond kind of straight up conventional profitable activity. Um, and conversely, that slightly slowing down, I mean, you know, this is what the sort of reasonable position, right? It's like, hey, you know, GDP ain't everything. Like we could just, we could just let it go, you know, just maybe half a percent. We could just slow it down a little. Um, and we could have all these other things in exchange. I think, first of all, that exchange is often a false one. And second, even slowing down growth a little has massive, massive consequences in the long term. This is just the kind of compound interest theory of things um, that a little less growth now is is unconscionably less for future generations. And, um, you know, I also think that many of the problems that he's describing, uh, they are they are consequences of growth. But I think that more more growth also holds the solutions. Like I, I don't think just because something was caused by a phase of economic development means the answer is less economic development. Sometimes it's still more. So more growth forever and ever. Amen. Uh, Nick, how do you plead? I uh, would uh, point the reader uh, to various articles by Ron Bailey that first off talk about how the species extinction uh, estimates are almost all wildly overstated. Um, so if the origin of this question comes from an empirical fact, we should go back to that and be more uh, cautious about what we're saying there. But beyond that, to to agree with what Catherine is talking about, you know, economic growth does not mean environmental despoilation by any stretch. Just as wealthy countries start to uh, preserve their heritage, the minute that they get to a point where they actually can have nostalgia for the past rather than running screaming from it. Uh, you know, in, in the environmental world, this happens too. There's an environmental Kuznets curve. Once you reach a certain level of GDP, you start taking care of the planet in a much better way. Think about, uh, you know, the, the example that always used to come up was East Germany and West Germany. West Germany was a productive country. Uh, West Germany took much better care of its natural resources than East Germany because they could afford to. And with that higher level of economic growth, uh, comes a higher interest in and demand for environmental preservation. These things are not mutually exclusive in any way, shape, or form. And really, just to underscore Catherine's point, you know, when, uh, economic growth isn't something that you can fine tune. It's not, you know, it, it's not some kind of little, uh, uh, you know, uh, measure that you can change. You either have it or you don't. Um, and uh, you know, if we think we can take it down from three percent to two percent, which would be awful. And it's kind of what we've been doing or taking it down from 2% to 1%. You don't want to live in that world. It's going to end up being poorer and dirtier. Peter, you're from Florida. Hasn't the the mania for growth ruined the Everglades or something? Surprise. It's an Everglades question. 
<laughs> I, I don't know. I've heard there's still a, a bunch of cool alligators or something there. Is in okay. hovercrafts if you want to take the tour. I've never done it. Um, no, the uh, look. The what Catherine and Nick said is tr is right. That wealthier societies are on average much better for the environment. You see this throughout history when you compare, say, uh, first world. Um, you know, uh, uh, dem democracies versus uh, communist countries or more authoritarian countries a hundred years ago. But also you see this today where wealthier societies are just have per capita much lower emissions than uh, d than uh, other societies. But let's let's table that for a second. Let's say that I'm like a little bit convinced by this reader's point that maybe there are some trade-offs that are worth making. We're right now making too many trade-offs against growth. And I will, I will take this point much better at the point that we have some sort of budget for those trade-offs. Because right now what happens is everybody makes their case. Well, you know, we got to save the, uh, the, you know, the three-footed toucan from the whatever or something. And like, so that means we can't build this thing here. Okay, fine. The three-footed toucan, we're going to, that's going to be our cause for here. But then over here, we also got to save the 74-foot salamander that like there's only 12 of these left and right. And okay, we're not going to build anything there. All right. Wait, like at some point, you have to make a, a, a decision about how much growth you are willing to trade off. And if you look at all of the federal agencies, each of which has hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of pages of rules, the vast majority of those rules are growth trade-off rules. And no one has thought about them in, in a sort of holistic budgetary way in the context of all the other rules. They just say, well, this rule is worth it. It costs us $100 million a year. It costs us a billion dollars a year in economic activity. And, and we need to be thinking about this in that holistic contextual way before we can start saying, well, we're going to say, okay, every now and then we'll make some trade-offs against uh, that that are that limit growth. We're not doing that. And so until we get there, then I'm going to be pro-growth all the way. I would only add that the, uh, you know, if we postulate that the um, more or less uh, elimination of extreme global poverty over the last 30 years is the single most important and underrated uh, news story. Uh, one of the uh, underrated news stories uh, uh, as well is that richer countries have been now for the past 10, 15 years um, uh, doing less carbon emissions, getting cleaner, um, reforesting, not deforesting, um, uh, and et cetera. Um, I can't speak specifically to um, uh, biodiversity, um, but uh, there is a cleanliness. The waters are cleaner. The air is cleaner um, with all of these rich countries. That's where the trend line is going. And if you get to a certain level of richness, um, it starts to go. Well, if you're going from, from poor to industrializing, as China and India have been doing um, while eliminating extreme poverty, uh, yes, you are going to add a lot of net uh, carbon and pollutants in the air, uh, and then people will start to get rich enough to be able to demand like, hey, I don't want to breathe this shit. Um, so um, something to think about. This is all a perfectly good uh, transition into mm -hmm. our next topic, um, which is uh, this. On Friday, President Joseph Robinette Biden, the uh, second, third, I forget, second, uh, issued mm -hmm. a uh, temporary pause. He likes ice cream. I do uh, air quotes now that people can see in theory if we release this as video. Temporary pause on liquefied natural gas export terminal projects, at least until the Department of Energy can update the underlying analyses for authorizations. Uh, Biden says he's making this move because, and this is a real quote, while MAGA Republicans willfully deny the urgency of the climate crisis, condemning the American people to a dangerous future, my administration will not be complacent. End quote. We live in a stupid country. Uh, sorry, did I say that out loud? Uh, this election year move comes as American oil production led by fracking and natural gas extraction has reached all time highs, helping drive down the price of gas, which the White House has claimed total credit for, citing its environmental policies. Uh, Peter, uh, oh, I just want to ask the process question on this. Doesn't this seem like a real bad process? Yeah, it's yeah. a bad process. And like typical bad process. Um, it's the like, same bad process that we do for all major climate related projects and energy projects. It's also the same bad process that got us where we are at the border. Like if you just temporarily say this seems bad, I'll get back to you about <laughs> everything. <laughs> 
then you're it's going to be a mess. Of course, it's going to be a mess. Of course, we're not going to invest in the right things. Of course, we're not going to have peace and, and order at the border. Like, like this is it's the worst process. And it's the process we're using for everything. Also, it's an election year political stunt designed to the youths. Uh, to appease a key Biden constituency, in particular, the funded climate activists. And so when I say climate activists here, I don't mean people who actually like manage woods. You know, I don't mean people who are like de- like quite involved with, you know, uh, with the land and with animals. I mean, the people who work for foundations that do stuff in Washington, D.C. I mean, pe- groups like Climate Defiance. And I named Climate Defiance because the White House named Climate Defiance in their brag sheet that they published on (laughs) thewhitehouse.com under the what they are saying. Leaders praise Biden-Harris administration pause on pending decision of liquefied natural gas exports. And so they published the... Good job note from this group, Climate Defiance, which tweeted this out. They were very proud of themselves. And they were like, who are we? You don't know who we are, but we're Climate Defiance. And they defined themselves. We are a radical collective of young people working to topple the fossil fuel industry. We've blockaded the White House Correspondents' Dinner, stopped play at the congressional softball game, and sent top presidential advisors fleeing. Follow along. Right, so they're not even bragging about having any real impact. They're bragging about being obnoxious and annoying. Yeah, And that's the people that the Biden administration has set out to appease here. I really wish they had tried to glue themselves to Congress at the uh, softball game. It's easier to pepper <laughs> you know, spray. That would have been nice. Uh, there's also the role of the uh, TikToker Alex Harris of Colorado, um, you know, who, you know, it's like if we're doing government by TikTok, we deserve what happens. Uh, you know, China wins this round, Matt Welch. Um, part of the problem here is that the Biden administration, then this goes back to something Peter was talking about, At almost every level of economic activity, and this is one of the reasons why Biden is a terrible president and why he has terrible disapproval or or he has high disapproval ratings and terrible approval ratings that rank up there with uh, Trump uh, at this stage in Trump's presidency, even before COVID hit. At every level, Biden is trying to squeeze down economic activity. If you talk to people, uh, you know, in uh, in business, they talk about how mergers and acquisitions Every opportunity that Biden has to say no or to slow things down or to make you shimmy through a tighter and tighter hole to get out, you know, out into freedom or something like that. Uh, Biden is doing this. It's it is a bad way to run a country. You you need economic freedom. uh, And, you know, when we're talking about something like liquefied natural gas, this is such a great thing to be happening. It's great for the environment. It's better than, you know, it's better than old dirtier fuels. It helps geopolitically because by having multiple sources in different parts of the world that are able to offer up energy, it means that places like China and especially Russia in the current moment or the Middle East can't dictate geopolitics as easily. This is such a bad policy. Um, and to the extent that it rests on the, uh, you know, the uh, stooped and limpid shoulders of Gen Z, they've got a lot to answer for. Uh, the swap out of, of dirty coal, even clean coal. Remember clean coal? That would be in every like uh, State of the Union address. We need more clean coal. Uh, the swap out uh, via fracking of liquefied natural gas uh, has been the single biggest factor in reducing carbon emissions in this country. So when the brag sheet from the White House, uh, when the statements from the president lead with, that's why we're serious about, cl-. no, that's why you're unserious about any of it. We've known this stuff for 15 years and you're still pulling this in election years uh, as a cave to you know, these groups who actually, they also need editors in this group, Peter, with a long list of things that they've done. They could have just shortened it like, we are assholes, period. And like, just like, <laughs> get, get straight to the point here, people. They're um, your favorite type of people, right? The the bridge blockers. Yeah, Matt loves a bridge blocker. <laughs> I mean, it's I also though, like, why why are we... Why are we soliciting blurbs on our policies 
Like, that's another question is like, this is not like a new novel. And we're like, oh, let's get some other popular novelist to like say a nice thing about it. And stick let's it get on the, the back. Peter like, Travers quote. Yeah. <laughs> Riveting. This is not, this is been, not yeah. the way. <laughs> Unless Three and it's a half just, stars. They're just, they're just saying the quiet part loud. Just like, we are doing this to appeal to young people in an election year. Thank you. Goodbye. Uh, all right. We're going to do a lightning round quick. Uh, can't let it pass that last week there was a New Hampshire primary. Very exciting. Uh, in the Republican side, Donald Trump won 54 percent to 43 percent for Nikki Haley, despite the presence of a whole lot of independents voting for that and more Democrats than usual in the Democratic primary because it's open. Uh, and the Democratic side, Joe Biden got 64 percent, who was not on the ballot. Dean Phillips, who was, got 20. Marianne Williamson got four. I think Vermin Supreme came in like fifth, not quite fourth that I was hoping for uh, on the Democratic side. Uh, at, at any rates, or maybe he was on the Republican side. I don't even remember anymore. Um, uh, let's go quickly. One takeaway each, beginning with Catherine. Nikki Haley is out there raising a ton of money right now. And I, I'm just trying to figure out what she's going to do with it. Right. I mean, I know I know that she thinks she's still running. But as far as I can tell, nobody else does except for the people who are giving her millions of dollars. So it's confusing to me. Um I will say the folks that are on the you know Axios had a report of her kind of fundraising sweep. The folks that are on the list of you know Republicans who are giving Nikki Haley money, they tend to be on the saner side of the Republican donor class, and and I I get that they're just still hoping that this is a fallback plan, a safety option, you know something will happen and and she will be viable. Um, doesn't look like that to me. So that's a total endorsement of all policies. Um, uh, backed by Nikki Haley's yes. donors. Just to be clear, that analysis really that I just there. offered is uh, no. I, get ready, y'all. Get ready for me on this podcast for the next several months. Like I'm holding off today because, like, we got we had like foreign wars to talk about. My none of the above animal spirits could have never been at a higher mark. Like none of the above. None of these people. Never. Just say no. I'm going to be the Nancy Reagan of politicians from now on. Well, I don't know what uh, RFK Jr. did to you, Catherine. Um, he's out there fighting for freedom. Uh, Nick, uh, one quick takeaway on the New Hampshire primary. Uh, you know, Trump is the Republican nominee. Biden is the Democratic nominee. And the country at large hates both of them. <laughs> the country it, at large and me specifically. <laughs> it is amazing. You know, but in polls, in poll, I mean, this is like, you know, we thought 2016 was going to be the worst. And it's like, it can always get worse. Uh, Peter, you know, after the ship crashes in aliens and Bill Paxton is just having like a lot of feelings and he's just like, that's it, man. Game over. Game over, man. That's my takeaway from New Hampshire. Uh, I'm, since we do visualness now, I can just. Uh, what uh, uh, what did that, that say, Matt? That said, that said uh, when hell was in session, it's the, uh, the uh -huh. mem memoir of Jeremiah Denton Jr., a, uh, a POW, Vietnam POW. Guy, haven't seen that Admiral movie. Stockdale, uh, among other people. Um, hmm. So let's get to our uh, end of podcast, what we have been consuming in the cultural arena. I'll uh, let Nick uh, continue uh, trying to invent something. So Catherine, why don't you go first? <laughs> so I rolled up here ready to say that I this is what I consumed, and now I'm feeling embarrassed, but I'm just going to say it anyway. I reread Plato's Symposium this weekend. Oh my God. I did, guys. That's what I did. <laughs> And I think that's probably afterward. Did you take the play doh and you make a, like a little like a stick it figure out of it? Play doh. It was play doh. Yeah, play doh um, symposium barbershop. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, uh, it was for a variety of reasons, but I reread it in part because, um, I, like, the cable was out. It gave the cable was out. Yeah, as if I've had cable for mm. years. Like, who has cable? Um. <laughs> Anyway, uh, yeah. I reread it in part because I heard uh, a song from uh, Hedwig and the Angry Inch, which is a whole song about Does the idea better. of love as so presented good. in uh, one of the speeches in the symposium. And I was like, that sounds bananas because it's this whole theory about how like people were two halves and they were torn asunder. And before that, they were like spherical monsters that rolled around challenging the gods. Anyway, I wanted to check if I remembered that that was actually true. And um, I'm here to just tell you that Plato's Symposium is pretty funny and you should consider rereading it. It's also very, very short. But 
Uh, I think, uh, in retrospect, my answer about like um, Republicans seeking virtue in war is probably because I just spent a little too much time with the Greeks this weekend. And so I apologize to everyone. Plato Symposium. It's pretty good. Also, Hedwig and the Angry Inch. It's pretty good. I just. Uh, That's what I read. That's what I'm consuming. OK, yeah. if you can be this like, I looked at a baseball, then I can want. say this. Uh, Peter, what did you consume? So I've been watching clips from Steven Soderbergh, Steven Soderbergh's really fascinating 2014 experimental recut of Raiders of the Lost Ark, the great movie that launched the Indiana Jones uh, franchise back in the early 1980s. And Soderbergh just made two changes to this movie. The first was that he removed all of the sound and replaced it with Trent Reznor's social network soundtrack. So it's now got this kind of like creepy uh, electronic dark vibe to it. And then he also took all the color out of the movie and tr and transformed it into a black and white film. And he did this, he says in a little essay that he wrote on his website, as, a, as an experiment so that you could just focus on the staging of the movie. And this is something that really struck me when I saw Raiders of the Lost Ark on the big screen last year for the first time, was how expertly this movie is staged. And I mean, every one of the shots is composed almost like almost like a, a sort of perfect little bit from a, a, a stage musical or a, a stage production where you've got a whole bunch of people and they're all lined up perfectly and everything is kind of surrounding the central character. Uh, you have all of these fantastic silhouettes throughout the movie. I mean, it starts with one of the most iconic silhouettes ever put on film, that shot of Indiana, um, you know, sort of in uh, where you just see the outlines of him with his jacket and his hat. And you think about that silhouette and all of the elements all of the sort of creative decisions that went into getting that shot. It's not just, oh, Steven Spielberg sort of wakes up on the morning, they're going to shoot the opening of the movie. And it's like, yeah, I guess we'll we'll shoot it like this. It's it's also the costuming department. It's the stance which with which uh, Harrison Ford is, you know, moving through the shot, right? And sort of holding himself and his body. It's the whip. It's the hat. It's all right. It's also Douglas Slocum and his absolutely incredible photography. I mean, just uh, just so artful and so cinematic and what this what this Soderbergh cut does is it puts all of the all of the staging decisions, all of the editing decisions, all of the visual language of the movie into sharp relief. It allows you to focus on it better without thinking so much about the story and you see just how beautiful the film is, how uh, how iconic all of these shots are, but also, you also see how easy it is to just follow every, all of the action. It is just amazing, especially in the sort of uh, you know, the, the the late years of shaky cam um, here, where that that is that's kind of dying in cinema. I mean, I think John Wick has tr has helped kill off that tendency. But where you can where you can just follow, no matter how fast the cuts are moving, you can follow every single bit of the action, and you always know exactly where every character and object is in relationship to every other character and object. And it's such a great little lesson in the craft of cinema and how good Steven Spielberg was at it 40 years ago uh, in one of the great popular movies ever made. Uh, Nick, I know that the late years of Shaky Cam is going to be your next oh, yeah. erotic memoir. Uh, what have you... Thank you. Uh, uh, That's, what... uh, you know, I'm also looking forward to the era of uh, shaky viewers. So, like, you know, as long <laughs> as we're shaking, the camera can be still. That's right. Uh, what did you consume, Nick? Uh, well, you know, uh, over the weekend, like Peter, I consumed some cinema. Uh, I was in a hotel and I ended up watching a couple of Hallmark movies, which I highly, highly recommend. Are uh, we okay? Called, did you watch royal, them entirely in black and white wedding. with a Nine Inch Nails yeah. soundtrack? Oh, yeah, of course. I only see in black and white anyway. You know, yeah. I don't know what happened, uh, but... Uh, and uh, paging Mr. Darcy, things like that. What I, I highly recommend checking out the Hallmark Channel whenever you get the chance. Just Stay for general. five minutes. Uh, what I read uh, this past week is a uh, new book by a UC Santa Cruz historian named Benjamin Breen. It's called Tripping on Utopia, Margaret Mead, the Cold War, and the Troubled Birth of Psychedelic Science. And it's a, an attempt to recast how psychedelics um, kind of entered into the American mainstream or 
It's somewhere between the mainstream and the avant-garde in the 50s. And instead of focusing on people like Timothy Leary and Richard Albert slash Ram Dass and whatnot, it, it starts the clock a little bit earlier and talks about Margaret Mead and her uh, one-time husband, the uh, sociologist and kind of uh, gadfly intellectual Gregory Bateson, and the way that they actually uh, helped bring a certain strain of thinking related to psychedelics, uh, and particularly LSD and therapy in the 1950s and early 60s, um, and also how they were deeply uh, implicated in Cold War attempts through uh, the CIA as well as the Department of Defense to use these drugs in ways that were kind of nefarious in a broader sense. <clears throat> Excuse me, if you're interested in the history of post-war intellectual uh, and commercial developments, this ties into a number of critiques and analysis that point, at, uh, point to the way that defense spending really underwrote a massive amount of Silicon Valley development in California's economy, certainly a lot of the things that made America the country of the future, but also culturally uh, in terms of things like Encounter Magazine and a wide variety of different cultural activities that places like the CIA underwrote. Um, so it's, it's very interesting in that way. If you're interested in psychedelic history, this is a, an absolute must read. The other thing as I was reading this, and if you're a reason reader who remembers the 90, one thing that I've noticed because the author um, comes back to, or he sides on the question of like, these things need to be kind of gatekeepered and regulated in various ways. And we would probably disagree exactly what that means if I was talking to him. But I've noticed many of the arguments that we thought were kind of absolutely won in the 90s. And this includes things like, well, you know, immigration, more immigration is better than less immigration, more free trade is better than less free trade, more individual choice in the technologies of living uh, and technologies of the self that we use are better. Um, those are being attacked or rethought and reformulated. And so, you know, Hayek somewhere, and I'll mangle it, said, you know, that every generation needs to recast the arguments for freedom in new and urgent terms. And it's, you know, fascinating to me to see how many things that seem to have been won, many intellectual and cultural arguments in the, in the 90s are actually coming back where people are saying, you know what, maybe individuals can't handle the range of choice and the depth of choice they have, whether we're talking about social media or uh, you know, literature and culture or drugs. Um, so I recommend reading Tripping on Utopia, Margaret Reed, The Cold War, and The Troubled Birth of Psychedelic Science, but also uh, reading it critically. While the Hallmark Channel is blaring in your hotel room. Oh, yeah, that uncritically. Uh, the Hallmark <laughs> Channel, no, well, you know what? When you see genre uh, kind of work, uh, it helps you understand why artistic forms are better or worse. Uh, pursuant to that last uh, point about uh, individual freedom and stuff, I just saw uh, I, that uh, referenced on Twitter, a new poll showing that uh, comparing... Um, uh, people who graduated, like Catherine Ringu Ward from uh, 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 Ivy League schools, uh, uh, answer to the question of, do you think America has too much freedom compared to non um, Ivy League school grads? And it's oh. amazing. It's like 54%. Yep, too much freedom here at old Please Ron DeSantis. Please share the you. link yeah, for it, that. I'm yeah. sure it's, uh, I'm sure it's uh, top, top quality public policy research. Uh, my what you have been uh, consuming. Uh, last week, uh, Melanie, the uh, singer, songwriter, chanteuse, ingenue from the late 60s and early 70s who performed at Woodstock. You might uh, remember her for the uh, semi-novelty hit single, Brand New Key. Oh, man. She had a pair of brand new roller skates and you mm -hmm. had the brand new key. Uh, there was no suggestive material uh, or uh, subtext there. Um, anyway, she died. After uh, leading a, a rich and interesting life, uh, I went down, as one does, uh, the rabbit holes of Wikipedia and of Spotify and listened to a bunch of her stuff. Uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, have a friend who uh, covered idiosyncratic melody uh, songs over the years, including uh, Is She As Pretty As Me, which is one of the weirdest songs you'll ever hear. Um, but this all led me uh, to... Um, I, Reled me, let's say, to uh, Miley Cyrus's Backyard Sessions, 
which she did. I think most of it was during COVID um, uh, because because you could still like go backyard back then. And it was the lockdowns. Uh, She had really nice big microphone and some good musicians. And they did a lot of really great, mostly covers of things. And she does a cover uh, duet with Melanie, um, who was still alive back then and was still in fantastic voice, uh, just gravelly, but elastic and big and strong and weird. And, uh, and Miley Cyrus, who's a, a phenomenal singer, I think, and, and a very generous, uh, artist, uh, like honoring those who went before. She's very much like uh, Dave Grohl in that respect. Um, it's a really terrific uh, cover of look what they've done to my song, ma, uh, which is a great, uh, weird little song. Uh, from Melanie. So if you're starting down your Melanie journey, I would begin with the Miley Cyrus uh, Backyard Sessions mashup with Melanie and then uh, go forth after that. And fun fact about Melanie, she described herself as a libertarian, um, as uh, Jesse Walker was pointing out, that she was one of those people who would show up on those kind of C-list celebrities who said that they're a libertarian. Uh, very interesting background, uh, interesting person to uh, go and, and learn things about. Um, uh, And that's the end of uh, uh, that tune. Uh, We are now uh, wrapping up this podcast, The Reason Roundtable. Thank you for listening to it. Uh, We have a lot of events uh, over time, but I understand, Catherine, that uh, this coming weekend, Reason is uh, taking a pretty active role at LibertyCon in Washington, D.C. Do you wish to speak to that? We sure are. There are going to be quite a few Reason staffers participating in um, Students for Liberty's annual conference, LibertyCon, and um, full disclosure, I am on the board of Students for Liberty because I oh. think it's a really cool organization that helps uh, bring the freedom to the youths and help the youths bring the freedom to the world. Um, I guess not the Ivy League youths who think that mm-hmm. everyone has too much freedom, but um, more like the um, like the the youths in Argentina, let's say. Um, the conference is pretty fun. And uh, I think it will feature Nick interviewing Justin Amash. I've got a panel. Stephanie Slade's going to be talking about the Game of Thrones. Uh, there's just like a whole bunch of stuff going on. So um, if you are in D.C. or if you can be in D.C. and you want to come, I think there are still tickets. And um, it's a good time. Other events that we are having in the future can be found at Reason.com slash events. Are there podcasts at Reason.com podcast? Catherine, do our newsletters now get catched at reason.com newsletters i hope we do have if you go to reason.com newsletters you can sign up for quite a few newsletters we've got some new ones we've got an elizabeth nolan brown newsletter on sex and tech we've got a robbie suave newsletter on the media and censorship and stuff and stuff we of course have christian bridgekey's newsletter on uh housing zoning urban policy and the like plus our ogs the reason roundup uh, and uh, Reason Daily, Reason Alerts, all kinds of good stuff. Um, we can be very much up in your inbox should you desire it. So Language. reason.com slash newsletters, sign up for what you want. Literally an invasion of your inbox? Yeah. Like if you <laughs> sign up for a newsletter, is that an invasion of your inbox? I guess so. Um, all right. Well, be careful out there, uh, and we will catch you next week. Goodbye. Goodbye.